All right, there's one round to go in the 2024 season. So I thought, you know, given so many of us have been eliminated from the final series, pretty much nine teams now, you know, worried about how the top nine is gonna take shape going into the end of the season. Uh, the rest of us are thinking about the trade period and the draft, etc. of course. So I thought this would be a good time to drop another mock draft. So in this video, I'm gonna go through another top 20 of how I think it would go down if the draft was done today. Bearing in mind, of course, uh, there's heaps to play out, draft, combine, rest of the season as well. There's a couple of different ways I could do this particular mock draft. I considered just going with the current ladder position as it currently stands, but I thought it might be a bit more interesting to incorporate some of the trades that we think are gonna happen. So in this video, we're gonna include some trades that are gonna affect the top 20. I can't necessarily forecast every single trade, just looking at the ones that might alter the composition of the top 20. I'll go through those before we get into the actual mock draft and then we'll have a look what that would look like if some of these trades get done. So to be specific, you know, there's trades rumors around, you know, Christian Petrarca, uh, Jack Lacocious, Dan Houston. I'm gonna leave those guys out of this, you know, for different reasons. I mean, Petrarca, it's too early to tell, but there's just not enough buzz around that yet to make me seriously think he's gonna move clubs. Uh, we don't even know which team he would likely go to. Jack Lacocious, again, still very early in those discussions, contracted player. Dan Houston, that seems to be getting increasingly more likely just because there's a bit more buzz about that trade potentially happening with Carlton currently the lead in that. But again, probably just hasn't hit that threshold where I think it's likely. But then there's, there's more trades that I think are probably almost certainly gonna happen. And so uh, we'll go through those and incorporate those. So let's talk about those trades. Which trades am I referring to? So I'm thinking we're probably going to see, most likely in my opinion, Shea Bolton, Liam Baker, uh, both head to Western Australia. Now, Shea Bolton, I think it was reported, had requested a trade to Fremantle. I saw elsewhere that that's not quite true, but the noise has been there for a while. And I think with his family situation, I'm going to say that it's probably going to happen. So let's say Shea Bolton goes to Fremantle. Liam Baker is another tough one. He hasn't indicated whether he'd go to West Coast or Fremantle. Looking at this, you know, if West Coast were to get him, they'd probably have to use a pick that they don't even have yet. You know, there's probably going to be, to be so many trades. So for simplicity, I'm gonna, I've got Shea Bolton and Liam Baker moving to Fremantle and the trade would be Bolton, Baker and pick 30 go to Fremantle for pick nine in this year's draft, pick 17 this year and a future first. So being specific about that. I think 17 for Baker is about right. So we're really talking about nine and a future first for Bolton. Is that steep? I think it is quite steep to be honest, but bearing in mind, this is why Richmond have thrown back pick 30 to Fremantle in this year's draft. With Richmond you know, potentially getting a lot of picks in this year's draft, pick 30 becomes a little bit less valuable to them. So Fremantle retain another top 30 pick. They give up nine in a future first, and I think it would cost that to prize loose a contracted Shea Bolton. So I can understand why either club wouldn't really want to go for that, but I think Fremantle's on an upward trajectory. They will see themselves as such. Richmond would probably balk at that still. But let's just say for the purposes of this, Richmond end up with pick nine and 17 from Fremantle for those two players. Tom Barris to Hawthorne is another one that I think is pretty likely to happen. Look, I don't know the specifics of it, but in terms of what's gonna actually affect this draft, let's say pick 12, which is currently Hawthorne's pick going into the final round, that makes its way to West Coast. I like to think more will come as well, but for the purposes of this draft, that's the only one that matters. Bailey Smith, I think is most likely to get to the Cats. Um, that is something that Toomey sort of doubled down on recently. So let's say that Geelong's first pick, which is currently 15, makes its way to the Western Bulldogs. So they now hold a first round pick this year. Josh Battle to Hawthorne is another one I'm gonna throw in here. I'm not too sure if it's likely, but he's still had a contract. You know, if he hasn't signed up and is a potential free agent, I think there are warning signs there. So I'd say Josh Battle to Hawthorne for this, which reportedly would be enough to generate band one compensation. So that means St Kilda get another first round draft pick after their first one. So they will hold pick six and seven in this year's draft. So then we move to Dan Rioli. Now, I don't know how likely this is, but it hasn't gone away and it has been, you know, they've been talking about this all year. So let's assume for the purposes of this, this that Richmond do decide to trade all those players and they target Gold Coast pick five. But in, in doing that, they give up pick 39 and 40 as well to appease Gold Coast on points. Again, I haven't done the math on how that all works out. Maybe it's a different set of picks, but Gold Coast get later picks to help them match a bid for Lombard, but Richmond get pick five in this scenario. And that's probably what it would cost to give up a contracted Dan Rioli, who I believe is well contracted as well, several years to go. So Richmond would probably do that for pick five in my opinion. So that is the foundation for which we are going to start this phantom draft from. And we'll go through the top 20, starting with Richmond at pick one. And in this case, ending with the Sydney Swans 
at pick 20. Before I get any further into the video, I do wanna let you guys know that this particular video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Here at True Footy, we really do believe that looking after yourself, particularly mentally, is very important. And for me, what that looks like at the moment is I'm planning a big life change, moving back to Australia at the end of the year. And with that comes some fear of the future. And I suppose for me, the biggest focus is probably getting to a point where I can feel good about the future and feel good about the direction my life is pointing in. And a great way to handle that is being able to talk through it with somebody. I find it helpful to hear myself say things out loud and it makes me have a different assessment or a different perspective on the things that are going on in my head that were previously a bit nebulous. And of course as well, getting some feedback on those thoughts I find really helpful too. And I realize it's not easy for everyone to be able to talk to someone. One thing I can definitely relate to is not wanting to feel like a burden on the people in your life. You know, we feel like people have better things to do than listen to us. I'm not saying that's the right way to feel, but it's certainly something that is a human way to feel. So this is where BetterHelp could come in handy because they are a platform that can match you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. To get started in the process, you can go to the link in the description or just simply go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. You answer a few questions from there to assess your specific needs and then you'll be matched with a credentialed therapist usually within 48 hours. You can do all this from the comfort of your computer or your phone. You can do it through video chat, phone call or messaging. So let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can help you by going to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. And with that, you also get a special discount on your first month. Now we're not really any closer to knowing who has who is going to go pick one. Uh, it is still pretty even. And I'm gonna say maybe Jagger Smith to Richmond. I feel a little like this is a lazy one just because he's played for the VFL team. I don't think that is going to be a huge variable in whether Richmond pick him, given that Harvey Langford and I think Finn O'Sullivan also played for, the, for their VFL team. So there's a few options there. The thing with Jagger is that while he may not have the weapons of some other midfielders, he's a very high production quality ball winning midfielder and probably just lacks a little bit of hurt factor. There's still question marks on pretty much every other major candidate and to different extents, we have seen form slumps from guys that may have previously been ranked a little bit higher than Jagger. So Jagger is still killing it. He was killing it in the VFL and I think he went back to the Coast Talent League and had a 40 possession game. So he's just doing his chances no harm. So at this moment, I'm going to tentatively put Jagger Smith as pick one, although I'm not convinced by that at all. So then we've got the Levi Ashcroft bid with North Melbourne bidding on him there. Again, it's all kind of all academic, you know, who bids on him, like it doesn't doesn't really matter for this. So we'll say, you know, Levi Ashcroft gets bid on and Brisbane give up their first round pick, uh, which, you know, is in the teens, whatever, they'll make a way to make that happen. Either way, Ashcroft joins the Brisbane Lions. Finno Sullivan then goes to the North Melbourne Football Club. Now this one, again, I'm not convinced about. Finno Sullivan started the year as a major number one contender battle some injury issues and hasn't really taken any strides this year. To what extent that is due to injury, we're not too sure. And I say we very loosely, but in general, you know, we're still sussing the vibe a little bit on Finn O'Sullivan from Vic Country. But I think as a high quality, high IQ, well-rounded midfielder, I think that kind of could appeal to someone like a Clarkson. I really don't think North need to add to their midfield. So unless they trade down, until that's rumored to be likely to happen, I'm gonna say North hold this pick. And if they do, I don't think they'd reach for a tall here. I think they'd go Finn O'Sullivan, who could start his career at halfback, uh, similar to a number of midfielders that have done that at North Melbourne. So then we've got West Coast. And I'm going to go with, there's a few options here. I considered Layla or Lawler. But I think I'm gonna go with Sid Draper, a genuine blue chip midfielder. High work rate, very good in the clinches, good acceleration, transition from inside to outside, tough little nuggety player. And um, I think, you know, despite the champs, I don't think he played his best football, but again, another player recovering from injury and his form since then, particularly at Sandful, like men's level, has been of a very high quality. He's gone up to the next level and performed really well. So I think he's only helped his chances. I know Toomey doesn't rate him, I think he rates him about seven, but I think he's a very West Coast pick and West Coast will definitely be in the market for midfielders. So and then you've got the Adelaide Crows. Now, they're probably looking for a midfielder with a point of difference in my opinion. So they've got a couple of options here and I'm gonna go for Sam Lawler. And I suppose I'm going to now commit to calling him Lawler, even though I read it as Layla, but everyone else seems to call him Lawler. Lawler is a very high upside style midfielder. So when he plays in the midfield, he wins clearances, he tackles well, very defensively minded as well, but he can float forward and take contested pack marks and be a genuine threat in their forward line. So given Adelaide's midfield, I think you know they're looking to diversify it a little bit. I know they took Curtin there as a big bodied midfielder. 
is he a midfielder, is he a defender? We're still learning that. But I think Lawler is quite different in that sense and a very high upside pick. Now, Richmond now hold the next pick because this is Gold Coast pick. So having done the trade, I think they might double down on the midfield purely because at this pick, there's still heaps of good midfielders around. Later on, they can get tools, which they also desperately need. But Josh Smiley has now slid. Now, do I feel strongly about Smiley sliding? Not really, but he has slid pretty much in the consensus rankings that are out there. You know, Toomey has him about four or five now, I think. Whereas once upon a time, he was considered pick one. Another player who probably, you know, maybe didn't have the dominant champs that was potentially forecasted for being such a big physically advantage midfielder. He's 194 centimeters. Um, so again, I think this offsets Richmond's first pick really well. They've got the small, high possession ball winner, death by a thousand cuts, Jagger Smith. They add a six foot five, would probably be five, six foot five or six foot six by the time he stops growing. Midfielder there in Josh Smiley. They replenish their midfield with two top six picks. Like that's a really good draft for Richmond. Adelaide could go Smiley, but I've got him sliding one more. I think Adelaide will prefer Lawler just based on a hunch. So then we've got St. Kilda doubling up with two picks now. For, I think they could probably still look midfield with this pick. Again, part of that is because of where they're picking in the draft, and there's still a few good midfielders around. So there's Harvey Langford from Vic Country, a player that I've recently come around to really rating, and I think Toomey ranked him as highly as pick three. It will be interesting to see where Langford goes. The only question mark on him is pace and how he's going to test. Six foot three midfielder, wins the ball really well, still gets a lot of metas gained, can feature up forward with his overhead marking, had a really good chance. I think he was equal in the Lark medal with Lombard. And uh, his stocks are rising. So again, pretty bare margins between a lot of these guys. Langford could go earlier. St. Kilda will go with him up here as another midfielder with a point of difference. So then that frees them up at pick eight to maybe go for a different style player. And I've got them taking Luke Trainer. It's difficult to forecast where a tall defender like Trainer will go in this year's draft. I suppose that there's a few pieces of logic as to why he would go here at Saint, the St. Kilda's pick. First of all, this is the Josh Battle replace, replacement pick. And Trainer is kind of a third tall defender at the next level compared to a Jordan Ridley and another player that can really set play up with his ball use coming out of the back half. So I think, you know, there's heaps of factors as to why St. Kilda would go here. Having two picks helps as well. You know, they might prioritize a midfield with their first pick. Trainer, you know, depending on where you rate him, I just don't see a team earlier than this taking a tall defender, particularly when he's not a true key position player. He's a bit more of a playmaker in the back half who can intercept really well. So that's my logic for trainer being there. Now we've got Melbourne who are taking a selection pick nine. And I think Murphy Reed here is a massive bargain. I could see Murphy Reed going a little bit earlier here. A bit more of a smaller midfielder who has some forward craft. There was a game, I think, against South Australia where he kicked three goals and had 31 possessions. Very high volume good player. On the small side at 180 centimeters, but makes every touch count and uh, very precise with his ball use. And I think he could go earlier than this. I, the reason I went with St. Kilda prioritizing a bigger body is probably just a bit more of a point of difference in the midfield. I could see him going there. Richmond could also take him, but I preferred them taking a smaller player and a bigger midfielder in the same hit. So again, Murphy Reed could go higher than this. And I think if this happened, Melbourne would be very happy to see him slide this far. So then it's Essendon, and this is where they'll bid on Gold Coast's Leonardo Lombard, who again is probably one of the best midfielders in this draft, legitimately. These academy players do tend to go under the radar a little bit. And I think Lombard, the, the people are sleeping on him a little bit if they don't think he's worth a top five pick. As it happens, I think Gold Coast will get him for a little bit of a bargain here and match the bid at pick 10. They're literally going to have an oversupply of good midfielders, having taken well, Jake Rogers as recently as last year. It'll be interesting to see you know, how early he gets a game because he's been playing men's footy since he was about 16 and played in the VFL Grand Final last year as a 16-year-old. So very high upside player, and Gold Coast will snap him up here. So then Essendon's back on the clock. So who do they go? Who do they go? I don't really know too deeply what their needs are this far out. I mean, I know that a small forward has been talked about. However, the development since I think the last Phantom Draft I did is that they changed the academy bidding rules, and NGAs can be matched at any time. So the effect on Essendon here is Isaac Carco is a high pressure small forward that is of a very high quality that they're pretty much guaranteed to get if they can accumulate points later. So they can use this pick on someone else and don't need to draft for that small forward role. This is a live pick. So I've got Toby Trevalia here. Again, very interesting player here where it's difficult to ascertain exactly what his position is at AFL level because he's previously been a courageous intercepting running wingman or defender rather. He's played a bit on the wing more recently. 
and there's some midfield utility there perhaps. And if he's a genuine midfielder at the next level, then his stocks really rise. But either way, I think the baseline you get from Travaglia is a very good defender who can run and carry. And ball movement is very important in the modern game, isn't it? I think Travaglia is a great option there for Essendon. Bearing in mind, they you know they took a key position forward last year and they're going to get a small forward later in the draft. So speaking of small forwards, Fremantle will have this pick that they retain. They're only first rounder in this year's draft now after all those trades. And I got them taking Joe Berry. I just really like this selection for Fremantle. I feel like this is not the first time I've put Berry at Fremantle. But he's a small forward and a very modern game small forward who, you know, he's busy in the forward line, good in front of goal, applies pressure, but also has a really high work rate and pushes up the ground. So I think Joe Berry is a really good chance to be a good footballer at the next level. And you consider Fremantle having lost Lockie Schultz last year, could foresee him coming in. I know they took Jack Deleen last year, but I think Berry is a very different style small forward with Deline more of a goal attacking forward. I think Boat Berry is a little bit more of a higher player and I think this would be a really good selection for Fremantle. So then Richmond re-enter at this pick and I think they're in a position to go tall and they'll pluck Harry Armstrong who's probably the highest rated key forward if I haven't forgotten somebody already. No, Harry Armstrong is the man I reckon and his stocks are rising and I think Toomey had him in his top 10. So, you know, I think he could go higher than this for sure. The only reason he hasn't is just considering the needs of teams above them. I mean, which teams need a key forward out of any of the picks I've taken already? I suppose you could say Melbourne, having drafted Van Royen, and, um, you know, I'm not too sure what's happened at Jefferson. I've really lost track of that. I think Melbourne could be tempted by the midfielder there in Reed. St Kilda need one. I mean, they've got Max King. I don't know if that's a priority for them, but it's it's possible. I really don't think Adelaide need one. Uh, West Coast certainly don't need one. And North Melbourne all the way up pick three. Yeah, they could take Armstrong there, depending on how the rest of the season and draft combine goes. But at this stage, it seems unlikely. So Richmond get a bargain there. They do need key forwards. They need talls all over the field. They need talent all over the field. So this would be a really good bargain for them if they can get Harry Armstrong there. Then I have Carlton bidding on Isaac Carco, uh, the small forward I mentioned before. Again, very dangerous around goals, very good pressure style forward, probably exactly what Essendon need in my opinion. So Essendon will match a bid there using later picks and Carlton are back on the board. So I've got them taking Taj Hotton. Again, I think they could use a, a small forward to some extent, but Hotton, while his brother is a small forward, he's a little bit more of a high half forward and player who started to prove himself as a midfielder who can genuinely accumulate the footy and he can make things happen as a playmaker too. So I think any team in the league would love a Taj Hotton. Uh, I think it suits Carlton, and the reason he's not going higher is because he did an ACL early this year. So they picked the Vic Metro boy, and I think they'd be very happy with that. It is possible this pick ends up at Port Adelaide for Dan Houston, but like I said, we're so early into that story, I was unwilling to commit to that. So this would be Hawthorne's pick, but now it belongs to West Coast as part of the Tom Barris deal. And uh, I think that West Coast could still go... Midfield, I think that would still be a priority, um, bearing in mind there's some good key backs they might get with their next pick. So I'm going to go with a play with some speed and class in Xavier Lindsay from Vic Country. Again, a very, very dangerous outside midfielder. Played a little bit of halfback because he's got that run and carry. He's got that distribution. He's got that agility. And I think West Coast, you know, watching them, they, need, they have a number of needs. But I think polish and skill and class using the ball inside 50 is one of the biggest priorities, having already taken Sid Draper, a genuine midfielder. Uh, Xavier Lindsay is also a midfielder, but you know, in terms of skill set, very different. So I think they'd be very happy with that, and it's probably a little bit of a bargain too. But you can start to get a feel for some of the, the strength of this first round because I keep getting down to different names and thinking, oh, that's a bargain. And speaking of, you could say the same thing about the Western Bulldogs pick here. This pick belonged to Geelong. It now belongs to the Western Bulldogs, having traded for Bailey Smith, which again, could involve other picks, but it doesn't affect this video. So they're going to take the first West Australian talent in this draft and take Bo Allen. Considering their needs, it's it's a tricky one. Could they go no, another key back? They do have Buzzlinger, and they definitely don't need a key forward, in my opinion. So if they don't go for a tall back, um, I think there's options later in the draft as well. They'll go for a midfielder, still need to replenish a midfield that has you know an aging Liberatore. Talk of Jack McRae finding another home as well. Bo Allen probably suits them here as a best available talent. Now, 191 centimeter defender converted to a midfielder, very athletic, very quick, ball use is decent without being outstanding, very tough and gritty, could be a genuine inside mid, could be a wingman. There's been comparisons to Ruben Jinmi. I, I see that. I think I've made those comparisons myself, actually, but I've also read them elsewhere and I, I do tend to agree. So they'll get a tough inside outside midfielder who can run off half back and be versatile and add to their young talent, which I like. 
GWS is a really hard team to forecast who they're going to pick because they've been pretty outspoken about just picking from their own board, which tends to look different to other boards. So ascertaining what they need is tricky. Um, you know, they could go tall. The t- thing is with guys like Buckley and Sam Taylor, like those guys have still got a lot of years left at AFL level. Um, and there's Lika Lear, who is still there. That they, they took in the first round a few years ago. I'm not 100% sure how his progression is going. So if they don't go tall defender, I still don't think they really need a key forward having taken Cadman and with Jesse Hogan in the form that he's in. This leads to midfield. They also took small forward, a small forward in Phoenix Goddard. They've got, they've got you know, plenty of depth in that position. I say midfield, having you know lost Taranto and Hopper a couple of years ago. Uh, so long story short, I've gone with Cooper Hines here as a best available talent. 190 centimeter midfielder forward from Vic Country. Again, the Vic Country connection also makes sense. Vic Country kids are supposedly less likely to request a trade home, and that is always going to be a consideration here for the Giants. But Hines is a very powerfully built, pretty explosive athlete. And from a best available point of view, this makes sense. I think Toomey's got him around his top 20. So we'll see what happens. I I do find it tricky to forecast what GWS are going to do. So now we've got Richmond again at pick 19. So how, how have they gone so far? They have taken Smith and Smiley, and they've taken Armstrong, a key forward. And therefore, you know, probably still looking tall at this selection, I think, because this is we're starting to get into the part of the draft where there's a heap of good talls. So do they favor a tall forward or a tall back? I think they could go either way, bearing in mind that Gibkiss they've drafted, he's just done an ACL, he hasn't had much luck. They could go with a key back, but I also think they could still go with a key forward. And there's probably a handful of good key forwards left and perhaps a depth of key defenders still on the board that Richmond could get with a later pick. So... I'm going to go with Job Shanahan here. Job has, in particular, like the last few weeks, stepped up to, I think it's Essendon's VFL side, and kicked like 11 goals in three games. A 194 centimeter contested marking forward. A little bit undersized at the moment. You imagine he'd grow. But the impressive aspect there is that he's doing it at VFL level. Like that is actually very impressive. So do Richmond need to pick two key forwards? They don't need to, but with the depth of tools, I think it's a really good opportunity for them because... After Tom Lynch, I'm a little bit of at a loss to see who the next key forward's coming through. I know there's Kaczynski, but it's not a very strong depth of tall forward talents. I think Richmond can absolutely take two in one hit here and go with Job Shanahan. There's still like John T. Fall and other options there, but I like this selection for them. There's also Jack Whitlock I considered, but on current form, there's a bit of buzz about Shanahan and I like this selection for Richmond. So now let's get to the final selection in this year's draft in Sydney. Again, I've made the point before, they're a little bit hard to predict what they do as well. They do very much draft off a board that doesn't seem to resemble what the consensus is in the media. And to be fair, they're very good at drafting, you'd have to say. I'm going to apply some logic here and say they need a tall defender. Now, there's a few on the board here. I've gone with Alexander Toru, who is a 193 centimeter, slightly undersized, but very good intercepting key defender. Again, 193 centimeters could grow out a little bit, but he's a good athletic prospect. And I think given Sydney's needs, it's certainly worth having a look at a key defender. They do have two selections in a row. Another thing they could do is take both Whitlock twins both Whitlock twins, if I'm not mistaken, can play at either end, but tend to be playing forward at the moment. I think that's worth considering with any of these prospects is that a lot of key position players do do an apprenticeship both forward and back. So someone who's drafted as a key forward may not stay that way and vice versa. But I'm going to go with Alexander Toru. Got a bit of buzz about him. Bit of a bolter slightly in recent times and just left field enough to make it a Sydney-like selection. But That's all I got for the top 20 guys with the draft hypotheticals. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments whether you want me to keep doing it with trade hypotheticals or you want me to revert back. Uh, I may do one before the trade period again and then certainly one after as well. So let me know in the comments what you think and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.